Well, good afternoon again. I want my part to be very brief. I'm Faye Shapiro, the publisher here at Compro.biz. And we're here today to talk about the truth, about journalism, about what's going on in Ukraine. And why we're here is because Brian Kiram, a week or so ago, posted on Facebook that live from Lviv. And I messaged him and said, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, that really... I was taken aback by that. Yeah, I thought it was my wife at first, but go ahead. <laughs> I was like, what the heck? Here's a man who practices what he preaches. He took himself out of the White House press room and took himself to Ukraine. So I immediately reached out to Simon Locke. Thank you, Simon Locke, the EVP of the Foreign Press. And I said, come from the Foreign Press, you have to do something. Then who to set this up? There's only one person, and he's here, seated right here, Larry Moskowitz, who I've known forever, who is a former reporter, journalism professor, foreign correspondent, and now a communications entrepreneur who's founded PR Newswire. Yes, PR Newswire, and later MediaLink. Um, and now he is the founder and CEO of a really cool new service called Lightbox Search. So, with that background, and Setting up this conversation between Ian and Brian, Larry's going to talk about a very tough topic. The truth is the first casualty of war. So thank you to Simon Locke, the facilitator to the Foreign Press Association. Thank you to PR Daily. Thank you to Capital Communicator. Thank you to Communications Match. Thank you to the Museum of Public Relations. Thank you to the George Washington University School, Graduate School of Political Management. A lot of thank yous. We want to hear from everyone. This is a platform for honest communication. Questions for Brian, questions for Ian, questions for Larry. Larry's going to stick around. And with yeah, that- I got so a question for Larry. Hey, Larry, I'm going back. You want to help pay for the trip? <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'm going to- In rubles? Yeah. <laughs> Cost I'm, you a little more money, pal. <laughs> I'm going to say thank you all. Please ask your questions. Please use the ask the question in the chat. We're here for you. So with that, Larry, take it away. Okay, thanks, Ray. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's an honor to be here and uh, make this little introduction. But one of the things that uh, uh, during, I guess I've been around long enough to and read enough uh, to know a little bit of history of journalism, the truth, whatever that means, objectivity, and what we call today uh, media which is very different from the world that, that met, all of us, I guess, grew up in. But I'm bringing you back a little bit to the Bolsheviks. Uh, so shortly after the turn of the century, talking about the last century, not this one, the Bolsheviks took over all the newspapers after the revolution, successful revolution, so it could control public opinion and thereby created the Soviet Union. 20 years later, only 20 years later, two decades, Joseph Goebbels took control of the German media, enabling Nazism to flourish and led to overwhelming public support for the invasion first of Czechoslovakia, then Poland, France, and then most of Europe, and of course, World War II. Only a decade later, the Kremlin jammed the voice of America and the BBC to ensure the Soviet public weren't exposed to Western media during the Cold War and learned only what the Communist Party wanted to teach them. Let's fast forward only a decade or two later, and it's been quoted, uh, according to a number of people, that CNN was one of the key instruments in bringing down the Berlin Wall, because the satellite television was a new technology. The East Germans spent too long trying to figure out how to block it and jam it, and the network brought Western news into the East. Now, Russia has once again banned Western media and imprisons journalists in Russia for using the word war in reporting about its murderous destruction of Ukraine or criticizing the Putin regime. Russia is also following China's lead and built the Great Firewall, blocking Western internet and social media. Only the Russian government's approved coverage of its special military operation appears on Russian television and radio and across the Russian internet, not the internet used to be called the World Wide Web. The public, therefore, uh, support this special operation and still revere Putin. History does, indeed, repeat itself. 
and the truth once again falls prey to allow the guns of war to thunder. So let's learn how news from the front reaches the rest of the world with today's guest, Brian Karam, salon columnist, member of the White House Press Corps, and author of Free the Press, The Death of American Journalism and How to Revive It. Recently made the decision to travel to Ukraine, just got back uh, during the uh, president's uh, speech in Poland, um, because to quote him, we deserve the truth and that's my job. Uh, interviewing him is Ian Williams, president of the Foreign Press Association. He's an author, writer, and broadcaster who's been a frequent contributor to media all over the world. His books have included several on the UN, George Orwell and the American Revolution, and include Deserter on George W. Bush's war record. Recently, as Foreign Press Association president, he's anchored briefings on most geopolitical hotspots. So at this point, I'll stop my history class and let it go. Gentlemen. Well, I'd really like to get Brian's view. <clears throat> I've, I've looked over Brian's book and what he says about the American media is true. It's also true about the British media since I've been present at the downfall of two old media establishments. But my first point was they were never, the golden age was never quite as gold as it is presented. It was always yes. tarnished. <laughs> you know, from uh, you, you, you send me the pictures, I'll send you a war. It's You're right. been a consistent theme. And it's that that failing that we have the war behind the lines now with uh, people saying, what is truth? Pontius, you know, Pontius Pilate raised the question, the big journalistic question, what is truth? And look <laughs> what it's done for his reputation <laughs> over the millennia. So, I mean, we question is, what is truth? And what we have to do is to try and get rid of the bias and try. It, it's difficult to be objective. In the face of something like this, you know, I, you, you, you've done it. You've gone there. I'm, I'm very proud of you because uh, journalists tend to work. Nowadays, that they fight from their bunkers behind the desk <laughs> and, and, and they hail telephones of problems and, 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 and email messages. So actually going there and being shot at. I've done it on occasion myself um, in, in the Middle East and the Balkans. I've had guns pointed at me and occasionally shot at and... Uh, Hell, that happened to me covering crime in San Antonio. So, <laughs> so yes. Hey, and I was brought up in Liverpool where you, you could get your face smashed in for saying the wrong thing about the local council and never mind yeah. anything else. So, yeah, I'm aware that, you know, to tell the truth, uh, as Bob Dylan said, to live, you must be honest. You really yeah. have to, um, you, you really do have to come in there and show that you are objective. So, you know, your problem, you're in the middle of a war there. And we have a sort of, I hate to say it, but it's essentially it's a fifth column behind. We're bending over backwards to try and see the positive. And then our own side are taking hints, uh, obviously fake Ukrainian videos, vi uh, videos and saying, look at the successes of the Ukrainian army. And it must be very difficult. But being there as well, how do you distinguish when, when our friends lie as well. <laughs> well, I, I think it boils I down <laughs> the, you, you cover a war. I remember uh, the Gulf War uh, was Heather Allen from NBC who said something that just rang so true with me. She said, quit sending war correspondents and start sending crime beat reporters because they know how to get to the truth. Uh, you get lied to by police so much and by and by the you know and by everyone else involved in the criminal justice system that you uh, you, you you grow skeptical, not cynical, but skeptical. Um, and then I also refer to, you know, the old Indiana Jones uh, uh, movie when they said, if you want truth, that's two doors down. That's that's the philosophy teacher. We deal in facts. And so you determine your own truth, I guess. But you we all have to share the same facts. Otherwise, what are we? Uh, I mean, we're living in our own head. It's it's solipsism. I, I mean, if you create a reality out of thin air, out of alternate facts, there's no way we can communicate with each other. So what I want to do is try to vet facts. Um, and so it boils down to me uh, in covering a war. It's the same as covering a crime or, or a spot news story. What do I see? What do I know firsthand? How can I get it to you? and tell it to you as bluntly and, and, and as honestly as possible. And to hell with the politics involved. So that's the challenge. And to get that, you have to get as close as possible to, to, you know, to what's going on. 
And in a war, that's uh, that's difficult because there are people who don't want you there, and there are people that will shoot you when you are there, and there are people who uh, it plays into their propaganda not to have you there. So that's why you know Putin has targeted civilians and reporters. He's not afraid of a bullet. He's afraid of what we'll say. And that's uh, the biggest fear for him is being exposed to being the uh, intolerant, autocratic despot that he is. Now, I see uh, Bellingcat has just released another report. We had uh, Higgins from Bellingcat a few months ago as one of our briefings, and he was explaining how they tracked down, uh, drilled down through the internet, through the radio, through ev everything, the poisoning exploits of Putin's men. Um, but then we're going to get people will throw back onto us, ah, but should NATO have expanded? And it sometimes takes a big effort to turn around to them and say, look, uh, Ukraine doesn't have any troops in Russia. Russia has troops in Ukraine. Everything else is commentary. Yeah, that's exactly, you know, I get so tired of listening to people going, you know, uh, well, NATO expanded too far, and that's what prompted it. I'm going, you know, from what I've seen, NATO, you know, uh, Ukraine, what does it matter? <laughs> I mean, that's politics, fine, but Ukraine did not invade Russia for no reason. Russia invaded Ukraine, and the Ukrainian people are the ones that are suffering, and all they want is the ability to decide their lives for themselves. And, you know, you travel around the country in Ukraine, and you'll find that Putin's uh, invasion, or I, as I call it his chosen war, has united Ukrainian people um, where they were uh, divisive before. They're not anymore. And the they're very, very salty people. They're not taking this going down uh, easy. And so, uh, you know, there's a sign that's in Ukrainian and in Russian at, at uh, bus stops and on, uh, and you see it uh, on billboards all over the country saying, uh, this is our ground. Uh, we live on it and you'll be beneath it. And they have gone after, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, I, I've seen this myself, farmers towing away, you know, tanks <laughs> so, <laughs> that were abandoned by uh, Russians. Um, there was, I interviewed uh, some uh, young women in far Eastern uh, Ukraine who were, you know, the Russian soldiers that were there and um you know visiting i guess uh uh we're using tender and they would lure the young men into in, in an apc into an alleyway and then throw molotov cocktails at them the ukrainian people have a stout uh and resolute continence that i don't think russia counted on and that's one of the things that we've been able to uh highlight i think um and i saw for myself that russia is i mean we got targeted twice by by Russians who were trying to ID reporters and, and track them down. I had to get my uh, fixer and his uh, fiance out of the country uh, after Russian threats. Uh, it's That's real. And the devastation is real. And, you know, I, I sat there playing. A, I mean, if, if anything will drive it home is I was in this place called the New Hope Mission. And I had met this little kid named Benjamin. He was three years old, still is three years old. And um, you know, he was sad, and but I started playing peekaboo with him. And as we're playing peekaboo, I he was laughing and having a good time. And then he turned and said something to his mother. And I said, uh, what, what, what did he say? And she said he wanted to know if the planes were going to fly over now and start bombing. I mean, the kid's never known anything but war his whole life. That part of Ukraine has been at war with Russia for eight years. Uh, it's, it's a horrifying specter that we in the United States and most of Europe have never had to experience since the end of World War II. Um, on this particular, uh, have you been in direct line of fire? Have you had to? Not yet, not in this war, uh, in others. Um, but uh, luckily, I mean, the farthest we got in country and we went all over the country, I couldn't get to Kiev. Um, well, I could, but uh, the train I didn't think was that safe. And once we got there, my fixers didn't know their way around. So I wasn't going to I did not want to turn left when I should have turned right. So I was very uh, calculating and how far we went and what we saw. We'll go back. Uh, we'll get to Kiev. We'll get to Mariupol. Uh, those things are important. I interviewed people from 
both of those areas, including a family in Mariupol who uh, lived across the street from the theater that uh, was clearly marked in Russian. It said children, you could see it from the air. They lived across the street from that. They talked about their apartment bu building being uh, targeted by artillery fire from floor to floor to floor to floor to floor, and then how they blew up the uh, theater. And the father that I spoke with was in tears because he was recounting having to bury a friend in his own front yard and trying to get out in the middle of the day during you know, uh, breaks in the bombing and the artillery fire to bury their friend who had died in the communal bomb shelter. It's not a, it's not a good situation. No, but uh, who, 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 who's taking your reports? Because I noticed from your checkered career, you have... Um, checkered? <laughs> you, you have resisted institutional pressures, which is why you're writing you're not writing for sort of the full mainstream. I incidentally have uh, written for Hustler and, and uh, Penthouse in the past. So ah. I join you on the Playboy front because they're the only, they often are the only people who will pay you to put risky stories because the others are too cautious. Well, this so is for Salon.com and for the Washington Diplomat are the two people that I've covered this war for. And then uh, part of it is we're putting together an independent documentary on the war uh, for a couple of producers, including uh, uh, one of the friends of mine who contributed to it is Cooper Hefner, uh, son of Hugh Hefner, who uh, put together the, you know, Playboy. But, um, I, you know, it's traditional coverage as far as that goes. It's just, uh, you're right, Ian, about one thing, independent journalism, and that's what I talk about in my book, real independent journalism is uh, sorely lacking. There's twice the number of people on this planet uh, on the day that I was born, actually almost three times the number, and uh, there's only half the number of reporters. So that's a huge problem. And uh, that means that a lot of voices are drowned out. So you have to do your best to make sure that your voice is heard. And have you, have you come under any pressure from them to, to put the line that you're not anti-Russian enough or you're too pro-Ukrainian? Well, I don't ever listen to any of that crap. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't had that pressure and I wouldn't respond well to it. If I did, I would probably just tell them to <clears throat> flip off. Um, you know, and, and I noticed that uh, there's uh, some liquor behind you. I'd probably have a drink while I did it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that was my coverage of rum. On the <laughs> revolution. This, this, this is, that, that's research material you see behind yeah, you. I've got the same with bourbon here. So <laughs> And, but, I, and I have a strict rule about going into a war zone. I, but, I will stay there as long as the bourbon holds out. It's, it's almost irrelevant, but did they really ban booze in, the, in Ukraine? Yes, they have. Um, there is no, but that's all right. I brought in plenty from Poland. They have no such predilection in Poland. So I was able to take as much. You can have it and drink it. You just can't buy it in Ukraine uh, right now. Uh, so uh, most of the bars are closed, which, uh, you know, the reporters sit around drinking coffee instead. And uh, that that makes for surly reporters who are more used to, you know, imbibing than they are drinking espresso. But I will say Ukraine has some great coffee. Well, uh, my motto was always where there's a free press, there's a free drink. But that's <laughs> <laughs> I often said, if, if you want to get the free press to show up to your press conference, throw in a free drink. Yes. <laughs> But, you, you know, you, here you are. It does, has, that, has that affected morale? Because I remember when Gorbachev tried to ban booze, it was one of the reasons for his profound um, unpopularity with many Russians. I think any time you ban booze, you got problems. But that's, that's just me. No, morale for the reporters or morale for the troops? I think the troops... For the people. I mean, for... Oh, for I think the general. people, like I said, there is... well. You can get homemade wine. I mean, there's a, a burgeoning homemade wine industry in, in uh, Lviv and, and Kiev and those and all over um, uh, Ukraine. So I don't think anybody's doing without. Uh, and I tried some of the homemade wine. It was great. Um, but it, those people are so resolute, so resilient. It, I really admire what they're going through and how they're reacting to it. I mean, even as far as like in, in Lviv, the, the population of that town has doubled in, in, you know, in a month, pretty much. So it's gone from about a million to about 2 million people. And the traffic is horrible. 
and there are crowded sidewalks and there are people trying to just go about their lives. But here you have traffic situations that in the United States would lead to, you know, road rage, right? We're at peace. You, if you had the kind of uh, traffic situations here that you have in Lviv, there'd be freeway shootings, road rage, people climbing out of cars and beating the crap out of each other. In Lviv, it's peace, love, see ya, wave, bye. And they weave, and I mean, very kind people, very beautiful people, very uh, loving people. And at the same time, eager to tell, uh, you know, the the one that you hear all the time, and I can't even, it's like uh, Putin huilo, which means, you know, F you. That's, that's pretty much everything that they say about Putin. Even, I, I mean, I ran across a 96-year-old woman with a cigarette in her mouth, and she's... And uh, she was quick to flip him off and say, you know, give me a gun. I ran into a farmer this about 40 miles southwest of, of Kiev who told me, he said, I hear Americans have many guns. Please bring them over here and we'll kill lots of Russian bears. Um, these are very salty people. They're not going gentle into that good night. And I sat there at one point in time um, in this hotel uh, restaurant. And it's about seven floors up in, in Lviv. And I looked at the panorama of the city around me. Putin can't take the country. He could level it. Mm -hmm. He can destroy it. But he can't take it. And he never will. Well, in between starting a subscription for a monumental statue of Putin, the founder of Ukrainian nationalism. <laughs> <laughs> right? In, in the sense of, uh, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's only half a joke because 10 years ago on the previous invasion, I mean, the, 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 the auguries were not good for Ukraine. It was divided. It was incompetent. There was little public confidence in the, in the government. The assumption was the government was ripping them off. And, and apart from Putin, what else has really changed in the last 10 years? Did any of them say to you what it is that converted the country from a shambles to a united and exemplary uh, one simple statement statement by president Zelensky. i don't need a ride i need ammunition when he said that that galvanized not only opinions in ukraine but across the world and i have seen and talked to people who are now part of humanitarian aid efforts and who have volunteered to fight for the ukrainian defense force based on that one statement and the one statement that uh, Biden made in Poland when I was leaving is also a galvanizing statement when he said, you know, my God, this man can't remain in power. Now, that's taken on a life of its own since then, and it's been walked back by the uh, White House. And I think that's probably the most shameful thing that they've ever done is walk that statement back, because that is a statement that was that came from Biden's heart after he sat and talked with uh, refugees. And as a father and a grandfather felt the empathy and the, uh, for those people. And so it was a very honest and visceral reaction. And if, my God, if you can't embrace, I mean, this is what everybody is saying. Now, they want Russia to do it. I mean, most people are going, you know, we can't do it. The regime change has to come from within. Maybe that's how you clarify the statement. But if you can't get behind um, that feeling and that sentiment, then when can you? Because the, the, pain and suffering that this man has caused the world and the trepidation that the world feels and the fear of being this much closer to nuclear annihilation because this madman has decided to start a war for no reason. That's a pain that everybody feels. And, you know, I was sitting at a, a, a news conference with all the mayors of Ukraine and mayors from around the world. And there was a mayor from Dublin who came on and was almost in tears. And the, you know, the mayor of, of uh, Kiev said, listen, you know, we're fighting for the democratic uh, principles that, that Europe embraces, please help us. And this mayor from Dublin was like almost in tears going, we'll do anything we can to help you. Uh, there's a feeling here that people are, I, I think this is the first, you know, in as much as Vietnam was the first really televised war, and as much as the first Gulf War was the first cable news network war, this is the first live streamed war. This is the first social media war. They call it the TikTok war. 
it's the propaganda, the ability to control the release of information by a, an autocrat like Putin is waning because people can get around it on social media. And that's why he's had to shut down everything in his country because he cannot keep people from finding out the truth. And the more they wanna find out, the less control he has. It's a frightening situation. It, and when the president of the United States said what he said, I, I, uh, my, my signal app lit up and my driver who, who drove us around uh, Lviv and, and through the countryside in Ukraine for a week, you know, he said, finally, thank God the world sees what we see. So to walk that back was, I think, a huge mistake. I, I know that, you know, they think that, you know, the world leaders think it's a huge mistake that he said it because the feeling is, well, if you're going to unseat, if you're going to advocate regime change there, maybe you'd advocate regime change against me. Well, if maybe you don't screw over your people, you don't have to worry about it. But the, the real fact of the matter is it's a very volatile, dangerous situation that puts the world in peril for no reason. And that's why the feeling is as it is. I feel a personal connection here with uh, Biden's uh, misspeaking because uh, I was a speechwriter for the Labour lead leader, Neil Kinnock. And if you remember, Biden was derailed in his presidential bid the first time because yes. he spilled one of Neil's speeches. So I feel a proprietorial regard for this. <laughs> my first thought when he said that was what he was actually saying and what his people should have said was, it's like the little boy who said the czar has no clothes. Yes, that's exactly right. Survive that public revelation for the Russian public. That's all he was saying. But he, yeah, he, yeah that should have been made explicit. I agree. I, I think you don't walk it back. I, I think, you know, <laughs> look, that whole trip that Biden took to uh, to Poland and to Brussels was a big, you know, big F you, a big thumbing of the nose to Putin going, look, the West is solidified here. I'm proving it in Brussels. I'm going to show up within a stone's throw of Russia with my guys, the 82nd Airborne, and I'm going to, and I'm going to Poland to make a speech. So get it through your thick head. This goes no further. I mean, that was the overall, that was a huge message that Biden was, was sending. And then to, to, to back it off, I, I think it weakened the whole message and I don't think it was wise, but I've often said this uh, administration's biggest problem is, it's communications department. They don't do it real well. He's fine. They're worried about him making gaffes and it's really them that do it. So they're overly protective. And, you know, I, uh, there's a question here on the, uh, that we have in chat about who's going to rebuild Ukraine after the war. Well, it's going to be the Russian money that's been seized. I think, uh, I think there'll be a Marshall plan like there was, uh, you know, at the end of world war II, if we survive. And I'll say that too, because the, the history of the world uh, for the next 30 to 60 years, or perhaps longer, is going to be written in the next 30 to 60 days. Um, Mehmet Donmez, I hope I pronounced that properly, <laughs> uh, wants to know, uh, from your personal observations, are the Ukrainian people really ready to resist until the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I, when you got a 96 year old grandmother going, give me a gun. I think that's pretty determined. I or think it, <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, I, you see the same kind of ideals in, in West Virginia, but it's usually guarding a still. But um, it, the truth of the matter is Mariupol has been raised and it hasn't fallen yet. These people are determined and most of the evacuees that I saw were uh, women and children. The men are staying, and a lot of the women are staying, and everyone who can fight is staying. And I have actually, on my last day in country, when we went to the train station, there were more people coming in to go back to fight than there were leaving. So I, I think there is a, a huge will to resist a huge need for the material to do it and a huge desire for us to get on board with it. But even <laughs> those of us who thought the Ukraine was in the right uh, and were very dubious about uh, Russian behavior, I've been really amazed by just how um, inept the Russians have been and how successful the Ukrainians have been. Uh, did you get any feeling of 
were you as surprised as the rest of us or did you see the tractor and the 96 year old chain smoker and say, <laughs> oh, <good> to go? <laughs> well, I was surprised. Uh, I mean, the will of the people it, it's, it, but it reminded me a lot. Uh, I coached high school American football, not, not, not soccer, not rest, you know, not European football, but I often told my kids, I said, a well-trained, well-coached team of lesser talent will overcome a larger uh, team of better talent because they work together as a team. And when you invade someone's homeland, that's a mighty, mighty way to, to inspire them to fight. Whereas the Russians are not inspired to fight. And the 18 or 19 year old conscript who told it was going to be a three day ordeal and then they come back conquering heroes and they're dying, uh, th their morale suffers. So I was surprised and in seeing some of the videos that I've seen from the front line and in talking with some of our military experts, the surprise is not in uh, it, it's in their lack of tactics and their combat tactics and how they react when they're under fire the Russians. And uh, so that I think that part of that is, was definitely a surprise me. Um, but I think it's a pleasant surprise for the people of Ukraine and it's emboldened them. So when the, when their president refused to leave, when he asked for ammunition and not a ride out, man, there were people going, all right, I'm in. And I think that, and the fact that Mariupol and Kiev have not fallen and the fact that they've been actually able to uh, launch a counteroffensive against Russia and some of the neighborhoods in Northwest Kiev has emboldened and, and uh, you know, and helped the uh, resistance thrive. And Mariupol is, is a key there because he wants to, Putin needs that to link up his con what he's conquered in the East and the South into one contiguous land group. And if he's not able to do it, I, and I've said before, I think Mariupol is a uh, key to that operation, much like Bastogne was key in World War II in the Battle of the Bulge. And you broke that up and you broke up, you know, that advance by the German army. And I think if they're able to hold on to Mariupol, um, it's not going to go. I, I don't think any way you look at it, I don't think this ends up well for Russia. The economic sanctions have uh, strangled them. Uh, there is evidence of dissension in Russia. Um, and there are definitely signs that they don't want to be there. So I don't know how this ends. I, nobody knows how it ends. We hope it doesn't end with somebody pushing a button and ending all of humanity. But barring that, I can't tell you how it ends other than the fact that I think Russia comes out with a diminished profile internationally and Ukraine comes out with an enhanced one. Sorry, we've got a car alarm here. New York's own edition of World War Three. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was War, another air raid siren. A clutter of car alarms. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you know, have you had any feedback? One of the amazing things about this, and it's not, I think, pointed out enough, is that the Russian speaker, the the persecuted Russian speakers, he has rescued, Sorry. mostly living in Mar living in Mariupol. Curse on us and um, and and um, Kharkiv. These were major Russian-speaking cities, and he's devastated them. And the people there are resisting strongly. Although, I mean, Russian speakers do have some grievances because Ukrainian nationalism has not been totally kind to them. But they well, are st they are standing by the program, and and they are they consider them, you know Slava Ukraini is, is what they're saying. I, I have not, you know, until the war. And I have one of my fixers was a kid I coached in high school and he was an English teacher uh, in Kiev and he's a Russian speaker. And he, so he was, he, he taught Russians uh, English and he taught Ukrainians English and his uh, fiance is a um, Ukrainian by birth and her mother taught Ukrainian uh, Russian and Ukrainian by all accounts. Most of the people I spoke with, so there was very little resistance to people who spoke Russian. They, nobody cared. You walk in, you spoke whatever you spoke, and people accepted it. So the, the, the precept or the pretense that uh, Putin made for you know, this horrible um, squelching of Russian obviously wasn't true because, as you said, in the places that are 
mostly Russian speaking, they're fighting the strongest. There is a, what has occurred is um, an enhanced feeling of nationality among Ukrainians. It has united them as nothing has before, or at least nothing I've seen before. And you would think that after 2014, and probably that's why Putin thought it would be an easy walk in the woods. He's been there for a while. You know, he's already he's already got some of the territory that he wanted. So, eh, I, I can walk in in three days and take it. But it's, I think, a lot of the resistance owes to the, uh, to the leaders of that country being as stubborn as they are and tapping into that Ukrainian pride. Now, in point of fact, if you speak Russian and only speak Russian, there is some resistance because Ukrainians are now seeing not only Putin as the enemy, but Russians as the enemy. And they feel like there was spoke to a, a, an old woman who, who came off of, you know, she, she'd been in an area that had been uh, on the Eastern front that had been uh, attacked, one of the first overrun. And she goes, it's not supposed to be this way. They're supposed to be our friends, our relatives. Why are they treating us like this? And so now there, there is some resistance to Russia. Whereas before, I don't think there was that much. I do think there is now more. Well, speaking of propaganda and the and being trapped in your own lies, <clears throat> just like uh, if I uh, comparisons are invidious, but just like the whole of the U.S. media bought the weapons of mass destruction, with a few honorable exceptions. Yes. Um, the Russian media seems to have bought it all, and what's more, the Kremlin seems to have bought all of the, all of the rubbish that they're coming out with i mean eagerly so but there has been some russian resistance and i i get the sense that uh you know there there is a question here that speaks directly to that were the russians uh duped as to why they were there yes there were some who thought they were just going on a training exercise and the um ukrainian military has allowed some of these russians to call home to tell their parents they've been captured uh we have accounts of uh russians not and, and really kind of freaking out after I think it's 15 up uh, more than 15 high ranking Russian uh, colonels and generals and seven of them generals have been killed. And, you know, there are accounts and I've seen those myself of, you know, Russians abandoning their vehicles and the farmers taking them. So yeah, I think the Russians were duped. Um, but that's not unusual. This is, you know, this is real Soviet style tactics. And remember, that Putin was a member of the KGB. These are all part of his old playbook. Just pull, I'll pull them out today. They worked 30, 40 years ago. I'll use them now. And I think that's uh, frightening as to uh, the profit. But like I said, I think it's limited. I mean, we did see members of the Russian media standing up and protesting on set. We have heard of protests in Russia. That's why he shut down the internet. That's why he's doing what he's doing because it's a social media war and some of that information can get out even if you don't want it out. Well, how is it um, with the Russian media? Um, do you get any sense of how that's... Uh, uh, do, do, are, are they actually conveying any sense of what's actually happening in Ukraine? Even well, in we're the, limited in our uh, access of their stuff as well. Um, I do know people that are trying to get the word out, but I know that it's hard to do it. Um, that's why it, it's important for us to be on the ground and be there. I, there's no substitution for firsthand knowledge there. You need disinterested third. And look, I'm a disinterested third party observer, not, not uninterested, disinterested in as much as anyone can be disinterested in a conflagration that could sweep the globe. So it's important to have us on the ground, putting things into context and framing the argument. So when you see video, you know what it's about and you know where it came from. Even the social media stuff, while good, can be twisted for propaganda purposes. So you need reporters. I can't stress that enough. Um, we need people on the ground who relate the facts and let people decide what they mean for themselves. That has never changed. I mean, you can go Hunter Thompson on us and you can go Hemingway on us and that's fine. 
But at the end of the day, what really needs to be there are people telling you what's going on and why. But this it's the what, what's going on and why is uh, sometimes two separate. Uh, Absolutely. Two, two separate. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's you, you, who, you what, when, where, how, and why. And, and, you know, those questions are always central to journalism. Who, the Russians, the Ukrainians, what, at war, where, in Ukraine, why? Well, <laughs> that's, you know, that's so, where so it all falls down, old, doesn't it? The old just the, if just the facts, man, yeah. um, was ever a, 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 a credo for a journalist. And I'm not quite sure it was a serious way. I mean, during the Balkan Wars, especially, I noticed that the best reportage was joint reportage where people reporting from Moscow, from Sarajevo, from, from, from Belgrade, uh, London, and the rest of the area, and integrating all of that. Or, you know, like Roy yes. Gutman from the United Nations, he was going there. He w- so it, w- it was an integrated package. Uh, are we equipped to deal with that type of journalism? We need to be equipped to uh, deal with that type of journalism. It is hard in the United States because we have become so enmeshed with capitalism. And look, I'm a, I'm a happy capitalist. I wrote a book. It's called Free the Press. Buy it early. Buy it often. Buy as many copies as you want. I'll happily sell it to you. But the idea that journalism is entwined with capitalism to the depths that it is today means that people are buying what they want rather than what they need. And so that's a difficult problem to disentangle oneself from. And it's harder to do internationally working with different companies and different reporters. It's hard to do internally in the United States because look, when I first got into this business, 80% of what you see reader here was owned by a couple of dozen companies. Today, a mere handful, five or six, own everything you see, you know, 96 per 90% of what you see, reader, here. It's difficult. You need to break up media monopolies. We need more reporters in the field. You need more than just, you know, when a newspaper buys up, like the Alden Group buys up several hundred, you know, newspapers, and each one of them has a White House reporter. And you go, well, what do I need, you know, that many for? I can do it with one, and they can service 400. Well, the 400 different voices are important to cover Congress and the Senate and the legislative and judicial and executive branch and to go, oh, and cover defense. You need those people. We need more people. We need our squeaky wheels in the press corps. (laughs) We always need this instead of what we have today, which is a lot of stenographers. I mean, I walk into the White House press briefing room today and I'm like one of the oldest guys there. And you have people that literally graduated college and their first job in the business is the most important beat in the business. They have no experience and they want the access. And so they'll do what they're told pretty much by the administration. So they get to fly on Air Force One and they get to be in the press briefings and they get to do what you know the administration wants them to do. They become propagandists. And look, I've been on Air Force One. The food's great. You're still sitting in the ass end of an aircraft and nobody pays attention to you. And when you leave, you got to walk out on the tarmac past roaring engines. So it ain't that great. (laughs) Do your job and worry about doing your job. And that's what we need more of. How often, um, you know, the the point about beat reporting is it's only a short step to being embedded reporting. (laughs) My friend Charles Lawrence with The Telegraph was one of the first embedded reporters because the cunning British invented this in the Falklands, didn't they? You got your wet reporters, you put them in there, and they did brilliant reporting. But of course, they only saw, if if you're with a bunch of Marines backpacking across the Falklands, you don't really get the Argentinian point of view much. And And you don't, and you drink with them and you become friends with them and you can't be, you know, that's one of the things that they do in the White House. It's, you know, they come out and call us friends and I have to tell them, no, I'm not your friend. I'm a reporter. Now, when you are no longer in the administration, and you you want to come to my house for a barbecue, maybe we'll be friends, but I'm not your friend. And so it's it's hard to maintain that distance, particularly when you're in battle with someone. And so it, but you need to, I mean, the, the military always makes a horrible mistake in how they look at reporters. Yeah, they tried to keep us out in the Vietnam War, that didn't serve them well. They tried to embed us and to uh, strangle us during the Gulf War and put censors 
you know, censorship up everywhere. I, I had to fight to get to the front there, literally. And the bad part about that was in, in Kuwait, first time in my life, I saw pro-American graffiti. You know, they were like, we love you. We want you here. Thank you. And the stories that we told there, I did by avoiding the censors and avoided being embedded. I was what they called a pool buster. I got my truck, I got my car, and I went. And so by doing that, I was able to get stories others didn't get. And that's what you And they hated need. you for it. The Oh, God, yes. Even when I gave them something that, you, you know, even what was funny is I got stopped one time and they were really angry with me because I would run the checkpoints. I would, you know, I'd find out what the, you know, the sign and the counter sign was and I'd pull up and they'd go, footstool, I'll go kitchen sink and they, you know, let me through. I was dressed, you know, in the gear. I was in, you know, I'd gotten a, a pathfinder with the upside down V on it and the gel on top so I wouldn't get bombed by our own people and, you know, and was identified as an allied vehicle. And then one day I got stopped by a guy and he said, um, he looks at the car and he goes, you're not military. And I said, no, I'm not. And he looks at me, he goes, uh, can you do me a favor? I said, what do you need? He said, I don't know if I'm going to live through this. Will you, I, it's getting close to Christmas. I want to send my mom uh, a message home. Can you get it home to her? I said, bet. So we started that with NBC back then doing uh, greetings from soldiers in the, in the war. And the brass could never figure out how I got through the line. And the, the enlisted guys were so happy that somebody was, was helping them out. They gave me everything. And that, that's the one thing that the we're banning you from going up there. People are going to stop you and turn you back. No, we just did Christmas greetings and sent them home to their, their parents and put it on the air. And people loved it. It's, you know, I, I, it's, it angers me sometimes that the brass is uh, made of people who seem to forget what it is to be human. And the, the Albert Goldson's got, it's a very good question. We're not quite sure your time in, uh, in Lviv is, is, is crippling you for it. How much communication disconnect exists between Putin's inner circle, which is his little KGB <laughs> gang from Petrograd, and the Russian military? Good question. Don't know the answer. Wasn't there. I, I don't think anybody has an insight into the, I, I think it's obvious by what we see on the outside that there is a great deal of disconnect. But I don't know if we know what it is because Putin has disconnected himself from the world and he sits making those decisions. And I, I think he's, look, I think he's afraid that someone's going to topple him. I think he's afraid he's going to be removed. And I think it's obvious what the American intelligence networks did on the run up to this war by, by telling everybody exactly what Putin was going to do, exactly when he was going to do it, that Putin is scared to death that someone on his inner circle blab. And so that's why he's cleared, you know, he's cleaned house. <laughs> that's why we haven't seen some people for a few days. He, he's going, somebody talked. <laughs> so I think he's scared to death that, you know, someone's going to come up to him in the middle of the night and retire him. Uh, you know, forcefully, willingly, or, you know, bribe him. I don't know. But I, a I, report, I think it was in the London Times last week, um, which suggested that his, uh, his intelligence officers had pocketed billions of dollars in bribes that were meant for the Ukrainian intelligence and military. <laughs> <laughs> and, and these people were scared that when they saw the war coming, they thought, oh, our number's up they, because they'll find out that we've been pocketing the money. So, um, <laughs> They're allegedly the ones who leaked the news to the CIA with all the accurate battle plans to try and avert <laughs> it unsuccessfully. Uh, any any views on this? It's it's too good a story not to be true in some ways. I, well, you know, sometimes the best stories. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't doubt it. I have no personal knowledge of it, uh, but it would seem to fit in with the general scheme of things. I think at the end of the day, there's going to be a lot of. Monday morning quarterbacking of what happened, how it happened, and why it occurred. Um, did the world fail Ukraine? Did this prevent a third world, you know, nuclear war? What did Putin do? Why did he? Why did he do it? Why he had to know some of what was going to happen when he did it. 
he doesn't want to go gentle in that good night. I've heard uh, speculation that Putin himself is sick, has had a, uh, a stroke or a uh, mini stroke or has Alzheimer's or cancer or a heart attack or an STD, you name whatever debilitating illness it is. I've heard a rumor that he has it. We don't it's know. Great political theater, though. There you've got uh, Zelensky wandering in a T-shirt around the streets of, uh, of Kiev. And uh, there's Putin on the opposite side of a football stadium from his closest advisors. Yes. And I, I reckon this is actionable intelligence. That's the distance a number of a poison dart can fly <laughs> that he's keeping from his own cabinet. He's taking no chances. Well, you know, that's that's true. And one of that, all of that speculation, that one of the worst parts of war is just trying to find out what the hell's actually going on. Other than, you know, putting yourself in physical danger, which I have said before, I, you know, I covered crime in Texas for many years and I, I was witness to several shootings. I saw people die right in front of me. Um, I, I saw them take their last breath on the planet and I was exposed to gunfire. That is actually not as scary as not knowing what the truth is. And in a war, as you know, we said earlier, the first casualty of war is truth. It's trying to find out that it's, it feels at times like you're in quicksand, just trying to find out what is actually going on. The only thing you know for sure that's going on is, well, that guy over there is shooting at you, duck. <laughs> that's about where, you know, at some point in time, that's, that's all you know. Yeah, we have um, there, there are sort of extra parameters with the uh, with the truth as we go. It, but it's also an emotional thing. You've seen, I mean, every time I see one of those tanks go up with a missile, I think, "Wow, great!" And then I think that was a package of canned meat. They were somebody's children, just yeah. incinerated and blown up. And, and on the one hand, you want to cheer, but it's not a war game. Those are real people at the end. Those are, and, and that's what really, for me, um, you know, I, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, I'm a new grandfather. I, I don't worry so much for me as I do my children and, and my grandchildren. To live in a world where we still willfully take life for no reason. We're the only species on the planet that does that. And it, that we treat it as a sport. And the fact that Putin can, one person can do this with impunity or seemingly so is what is frightening the most to me. It's like, you know, when do we grow up or can we, or is this the last call? I hope it isn't the last call for humanity, but like you, I sit there and watch those tanks blow up and I feel no joy. I only feel great remorse. I feel, I feel glad that, you know, that tank isn't going to shoot me because it no longer exists. I, I'm happy about that. But th then you take your second breath and you go, Jesus, those are people in there. And most of them are 18 or 19 years old and will never get to experience life. Um, their life has just begun and it's gone. I don't know how to get around that. I don't know how to get my mind around it. I've never been able to get my mind around it. I hope I don't because I think I would lose part of my humanity if I could accept it. Yeah, I think that's the well, that's the type of the balance. I think the gray area, the fifty shades of gray that real journalism functions in. You're not going yes. to cheerlead a hundred percent. And it, one of the persistent difficulties in discussing events like this is the uh, what, what I call binary politics. You know, yes. one side good, other uh, Democrat politicians must be protected at all costs. Republican politicians, fair game. So you never actually see. The, any complexities or subtleties. Well, but yeah, you know, and like to your point on that, what, what's frightening about that is it, what angers me is people will go, I believe in free speech. Okay, well, I think you're wrong. Shut the fuck up. You know, sit down. <laughs> you know, it's, I it used to be in our country that it was, I disagree with what you say, but I will defend to death your right to say it. You don't have the right to enact a hate crime against me. You don't have a right to, to hustle me, hurt me, kill me, or kidnap me for what your beliefs. But if you want to sit there and say, I believe in X, Y, and Z, sure, go ahead. I don't give a shit. Say whatever you want. I don't care. You can, you, you, you're able to do that. It's when you squelch people and keep them from speaking their, 
their opinions that you have true problems. And that's when, you know, it's like putting mushrooms in the dark. You, you feed them and they grow. Well, props. <laughs> we, I think we're, we're reaching the end now. Um, Larry's on Larry's on cue, I guess. He, Larry's <laughs> on standby. Larry, you, you, you can come and w- pull everything together and shoot us both. I'll try my best uh, with either a gun to that side of the head or to that. I think what we learned uh, in my earlier comment, which was uh, attributed to so many people, I, it was probably totally apocryphal and probably nobody, a writer made it up and on the copy desk, uh, that the truth is the first casualty of war. I think what we learned today is that there are many truths and there are many falsehoods. Yes. And we need the voices. We need a multitude of voices as Brian was saying before, as uh, the private equity firm is buying up 400 newspapers and reducing a small press corps down, down to one, we've lost different perspectives and different voices, different interpretations. So, you know, there's the facts, ma'am, and just the facts, and then there are lies. So uh, that's a, a kind of a, a, a twist on Twain. But, um, uh, and Will Rogers, all I know is what I read in the newspaper. Well, which newspaper? <laughs> So uh, you can get even uh, reading the same story on two major on the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, you can see completely different perspectives, let alone uh, this death of journalism, which uh, I'll give a little push for uh, Brian's book, uh, is is a sorry, sorry thing for me to see. Um, When I joined United Press International, there were 1,200 full-time journalists working around the globe for the SAC world's third largest news service. Uh, second only the AP and Reuters, or third. And <clears throat> now I think there's one stringer. Um, yeah. This is a major voice that has been taken out of global news coverage. Uh, Agence France Press is down to just a couple of hundred, I think. Uh, Deutsche Welle, very, very small. Deutsche Press, very, very small. So we're don't worry, losing- Russia today and Xinhua are rushing in to fill the gap. Yeah. So now we have social media. And uh, I have kind of a third of a book written myself on take the hourglass and put it on its side. We came up certainly in this country with a world with many, many voices, the pamphleteers, and there were many voices. And then it was really the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, that forced, quote, objective journalism because of limited bandwidth. So it was technology that enabled first media to become what we knew it, uh, with multitudes of radio, radio then reduced Changed it. that because it had to be the FCC had to control that because of limited amount of bandwidth. And so there had to be some balance. There had to be, quote, objectivity. And then along comes social media and cable. And the whole game is back all wide open again. But we've lost that collective smart voice. Learned well, well, voice. I, I say what, what we've lost is the uh, discipline. Uh, social media yeah. is a great thing. Uh, it, it brings a lot of points of view to bear, but that doesn't make you a journalist. It makes you an opinion writer. I don't think you can call yourself a journalist until you at least have a copy editor who sits there and goes, where'd you get that? What's that? Who's that? When did you? And, and then go through and vet the copy. You got to at least have a copy editor. Otherwise, you're just an opinion writer. And Everyone that's why. You, but you need someone who can point to you and go, that's bullshit. I'm not printing that. That's And and when you have that, then tell me you're, and that's actually, I'll, I'll, I'll make a plug for the book too. It's called Free the Press. And they I have some of that in there about what I think you need in order to be a, a, a call yourself a journalist. And I, I hope, I hope and pray that people read it with the idea of doing it right, because we definitely need more voices. And I definitely think that social media as much as it's disparaged today is the future for, for a free press. I'm afraid you're right. Well, thank you very, very much, Ian and Brian. Uh, we applaud your um, courage in, in going to see for yourself, report to us here now, uh, report for the media that you're covering, the documentary that's coming up. Uh, thank the foreign press corps, whatever's left of it. And uh, thanks everybody for their attendance and their questioning. I really appreciate it. Please, uh, somebody has just said, please be safe. Yes, indeed. And thank you. And I'll be going back. So, yeah, and Larry's paying for it. He didn't know that till today. <laughs> I told you in rubles. <laughs> Take the vodka. <laughs> oh. <laughs>